I'm going to turn it over here to our guests. Please give us a, a warm welcome to Hunter Lots, everybody. It might be really helpful context is it's like what a huge favor you guys are doing for us. Um, you know, the whole thing is, is that I love science and I think it's great. But the thing about scientists is that they're amazing at studying things and figuring out how the world works and then moving on. And then <laughs> they get very interested in these problems. And then they're sort of like, that was great, okay, you know, probably, you know, we should just move on to the next problem. But the problem is that all these ideas actually have real world applications that can actually be used to really help and impact people's lives. And so the whole point of the straight A conspiracy was that we found all this great science that could help our students and that rather than having it sit in academic journals, we thought it should be packaged together in the form that the most disgruntled, school-hating teenager could actually appreciate. And we were lucky enough at the time to uh, know Stan Rogo, who is the executive producer of Lizzie McGuire. And he said, you know, if there's one thing that I know about teenagers, it's that their lives suck. They may not suck in any objective sense, you know, in a sort of historical or geographical sense. They may not suck, but on an emotional, subjective level, their lives suck. And so the one thing that they will always believe is that they've been lied to. And he's like, so your book is the something something conspiracy. I don't know what it is. And that's how we ended up doing that. And then in the same way, we were doing this podcast, which originally was called The Brian Callen Show. Uh, Brian Callen, you may know from the Hangover movies and old school. He was pool boy in Mad TV. Um, and we basically just realized it was the same thing all over again. These ideas were not moving. And because a lot of Brian's fans are huge mixed martial arts fans, we decided to package all of that together and make it mixed mental arts. Um, but, again, it's one thing to do a book, it's one thing to do a podcast, it's another thing to have a community of people who are engaged and excited and willing to actually put these ideas into practice. And so a lot of what we talked about back in April is, is that this is the perfect garage startup. This is the place where you take that playbook, you develop it, you evolve it, you put it into practice, and then you have a model to be able to show all the community colleges in the country and ultimately the world, this is what happens when all these ideas are actually used. Um, because it becomes much, much easier for rather than reading a book, when somebody can come to a campus and be like, holy shnikes, there are 20,000 people, they're all really fired up about learning, and they're all being really effective at it. So the main thing I want to say is thank you, because thank you for allowing us to have the opportunity to work together and to take these ideas to the next level. Um, so, Scott, yep. are we ready to go? I'm out, yep. I'll let you do this. It's a PC, guys. I'm a Mac guy. <laughs> <laughs> the struggle is real. <laughs> So yeah, so I mean, this is all very much a joint collaboration between all three of these groups. Um, I'm also particularly excited that uh, ARC is uh, like an ARC welder, which just awesome, instantly makes things very cool. So the first thing to realize is that if you're talking about the, you know, how many tutors are there on a Los Angeles Valley College campus? Well, you're looking at about a 400, 500 to 1 ratio. It's actually the same ratio as physicians to patients. So the first thing you guys have to realize is that you are massively outnumbered, right? You have a, you know, a tiny number of you, and you have to figure out how to make huge impact on a huge, huge population, okay? And so I actually think, you know, my father's family were all doctors, and I actually think that the medical model is a really great model for how you actually start to think about education. So there's obviously, there's the people that you want to reach, the patients, but the whole goal of medicine, what you would like to do, is to have people not visit the doctor. You want people to be taking care of themselves, producing great outcomes for themselves without having to come to the doctor. And then they're only coming to the doctor when they're like, Doc, I don't know what's going on. There's this problem. It makes no sense to me. And then you're there to help me break down that problem and make sense of that. So the point is that you guys are the most valuable resource in the community, but you're there for the toughest problems. And so what we have to start looking at is what is the rest of the population, what is going on with them, that they're not having that self-care, that educational self-care. Um, and that's a large part of what we found with the Straight A Conspiracy, because Scott mentioned that the company that we started was called Overqualified Tutoring, because I went to get a job at Starbucks when I first moved out here, and they told me I was overqualified. I was like, that's a great name for a tutoring company. And the kids that we were working with, we were working initially with a lot of extremely wealthy children. So these were kids who had literally every resource imaginable. 
and still they were failing. And we were like, if these kids are failing, they literally have no excuse. And their textbooks were still in the cellophane. They had laptops, but they were only using them for cat videos. Um, and so, you know, if you had all these resources sitting around here, you, and you were still helpless and still not taking charge of your education, then holy hell, that was the thing that we needed to fix. And then when we started working with kids in the Los Angeles foster care system, we found it was the same thing. Right, that you know, their resources may not have been as impressive or luxurious, but it was the same thing. They didn't know how to help themselves educationally. And so it, thinking about it medically is actually a really, really good model for how we begin to look at how do you flip a campus like Los Angeles Valley College. So uh, you guys are all younger than me, but you may have seen Ferris Bueller's Day Off. So let's take a look around at this classroom and let's see what we notice about the humans in this classroom. Yeah. In 1930, the Republican-controlled House of Representatives, in an effort to alleviate the effects of the anyone, anyone, the Great Depression, passed the anyone, anyone, the tariff bill, the Hawley Smoot Tariff Act, which anyone raised or lowered raised tariffs in an effort to collect more revenue for the federal government. Did it work? Anyone? Anyone know the effects? It did not work and the United States sank deeper into the Great Depression. Today we have a similar debate over this. Anyone know what this is, class? Anyone? Anyone? Anyone seen this before? The Laffer Curve. Anyone know what this says? It says that at this point on the revenue curve, you will get exactly the same amount of revenue as at this point. This is very controversial. Does anyone know what Vice President Bush called this in 1980? Anyone? Something D-O-O -O economics. Voodoo economics. <laughs> okay, so what, what did we notice? What were some of the things we noticed about some of the things that were happening on our fellow human spaces in that classroom? The word boring looks yeah. common between all of them. Yeah, they were all bored, right? And you know, the interesting thing is, is that, so ben, ben Stein, who plays uh, the economics teacher there, he said that voodoo economics was controversial. That's the most boring controversy I've ever heard, right? There was no, he was also bored. Everyone's bored. And so boredom is actually a huge, huge problem because what your facial expression does is it communicates what emotional state you're in. And your emotions manage your attention. So if your attention is not available, then you're not learning. So now let's take a look. So we've got these three people who were chosen from that scene. And then let's look in the bottom right hand corner. Let's look at that human's facial expression. What sort of facial expression does she have going on? Yeah, she's captivated, she's excited, she's in awe. Now, what expression does the guy in that same photo looking at her have? Well, we know who he has a crush on. Yeah, he's captivated, he's excited, he's in awe. So the point is, is that their attention is super dialed into the object of their captivation, their excitement, their awe. And the point is, is that whatever they're feeling that way about, that's what they'll learn a lot about. So she's going to learn about, she might be really into the professor, or she might be actually really into the material. He is going to learn lots and lots about her, right? She can tell him literally anything at this point, and he will just soak it in. Um, so what you're seeing is, is that actually emotions and facial expressions are an amazing readout on what, where people's attention is and how open they are to learning in any given moment. And a really, really great way to think about this is, you know, it's like cell phone reception or Wi-Fi reception, right? So, you know, we all know the famous Verizon ad, can you hear me now, right? And the point is, is that nobody in that class can hear anything. We sit there for an hour, but how much information is being passed back and forth? Very little, because everybody's in this state of boredom. Um, and so if we now return back to these guys, we can think of it like little Wi-Fi bars, right? No signal, no signal, no signal, lots of signal. So 
These are really, really easy ways to think about if we start to think about this community of Los Angeles Valley College, 20,000 people, we can think about what is the emotional Wi-Fi on this campus doing? Where is it fired up? Where is it shut down? And then essentially what we want to be doing is we want to be improving the signal on campus. We want to make it so there's lots and lots of information transfer happening in this hive mind. So, it's important to realize that because you are getting students, you know, who are, you know, in their late teens, early 20s, maybe they're coming back to school much, much later in life, that you're getting them after a very long educational history. So, you know, this is a diagram from the Straight A Conspiracy that a friend of ours did up. And, you know, kids on the first day of school, student is exciticus, right? They're very excited, they're curious, they want to learn, they're like, man, I got a trapper keeper, this is amazing, and a backpack. Oh my god, look at my My Little Pony lunchbox. Uh, boys are allowed to be into My Little Pony, by the way, now. They're called bronies. There's a large and active Reddit community. Um, and, you know, then over time, what happens is that the feelings around school start to change. So we can see that the emotional Wi-Fi is shutting down over time. And that's because of a process that we'll talk later, but it starts to, you can already tell from the names on the bottom, right, you, you know, fear starts to set in, right, they start to avoid their mistakes, right, because they start to get overwhelmed, they start to have shame around their mistakes, and then ultimately what they've done is they've reached this point that we call whatever is clever. And so if school is a terrible, unpleasant experience for you, then what you do is you tell yourself that school doesn't matter. Because then you don't have to feel those feelings, and so you're deliberately disengaged. So what you're getting by the time that people get here is very often kids who have already gone through this whole experience. They're switched off, and now you have to help them switch back on. So when, you know, we went to lots of, I went to lots of fancy schools, and I never learned most of this stuff. Um, and so, you know, what happened was we would just hear kids say things like, I didn't get the math gene, I don't have a natural ear for languages. That was what I was focused on, because I was coming from the biochemistry science background. Katie was a humanities major, she was focused on storytelling and emotion. She's like, these kids are miserable, they're stressed out. And we thought we were dealing with two problems, we realized ultimately we were dealing with one problem. And the one problem is, is that we never get taught how to use our brains. So everybody at birth is handed a brain, nobody gets the instruction book. So what ends up happening is, is that, you know, if you think about, imagine if we sent teenagers, and you know, maybe some of you will say that we do, out onto the freeways with no driver's ed. Right? You know, they'd be like going around, they'd be jamming on the different pedals, being like, I don't know what this one does, oh my god, and chaos would ensue. It's very much the same thing with the brain. You know, kids are put into school, they're exposed to all this material, and they don't know how to make sense of what is happening, why these things are working or not working. And so very, a lot of people have, for most of human history, essentially concluded, my brain doesn't work. I got a bum brain, right? And so this thing is not for me, therefore I'm going to channel my energy somewhere else. But in fact, there's nothing wrong with the brain, it's just that you don't have the instruction manual on how to be able to learn effectively. Um, and so, you know, when we wrote this book, our real goal was to write the book we always wish we had in high school, the basically the step-by-step -step guide. And the number one piece of feedback we get is, this is the book I always wish I had in high school, because that was literally what we went for. Um, so, Okay, there you go. So, the first part of the book is part one, what we call the worst idea ever. So, what is the worst idea ever? Well, Steve Jobs, right? You know Steve Jobs as the eye god. But what does Steve Jobs actually say about himself? What does Steve Jobs actually say about intelligence? Oops. When you grow up, you tend to get told that the world is the way it is, and your your life is just to live your life inside the world, try not to bash into the walls too much, uh, uh, try to have a nice family life, uh, have fun, save a little money. That's a very limited life. Life can be much broader once you discover one simple fact, and that is everything around you that you call life was made up by people that were no smarter than you. And you can change it. You can influence it. You can you can build your own things that other people can use. Uh, 
once you learn that, you'll never be the same again. And so, you know, when we wrote this book, we had to see in that video. But really, what we wanted everybody to know was that one simple fact. And the one simple fact is that the world was built by people no smarter than you. But that is not what you have been led to believe. You have led to be, believe that some people are geniuses. You know, people like Edison and people like Steve Jobs. And what you don't realize is that while someone like Steve Jobs, on a personal level, and much of his success came from realizing the world was built by people no smarter than him, that was not how he sold his merchandise. He sold it by building a cult of personality. Um, because a cult of personality is how you get people to blindly follow you. It's worked since the time of Pharaoh. It's worked for cult leaders in Los Angeles. Um, it's worked for literally everyone. And so these are very carefully crafted images that are designed to get people to blindly copy. Um, and Edison did it incredibly well in his own time. He was the Wizard of Menlo Park. Brandon Strauss's book is a great book on that because he really understood mass media and he understood that image that you could create. Um, and you know, so a lot of the stories that you'll hear about Edison, Edison invented the light bulb. That is not true. The light bulb was invented 45 years before he was even born. Uh, the problem was, and you guys may not remember the filament light bulb, although if you hang out in hipster coffee shops, you'll see lots of them because they're making a comeback. But the filament would burn out very quickly in a matter of minutes. And what Edison did was he raised a bunch of venture capital, set up an industrial research lab, and he got people to routinely and systematically test the different types of filaments until he found the right material, which was slightly carbonized Japanese bamboo. And you can imagine that you get to that after a lot of trial and error. And so they tried 10,000 different filaments. In fact, he sent out multiple people to different parts of the world to look for different types of bamboo. Uh, and there were a couple of guys who died looking for this bamboo in various jungles. Um, but, you know, we don't hear about them because that's not part of the story. The story is, you know, the Wizard of Menlo Park, ding, the light bulb overhead, the sudden inspiration. Um, you know, Steve Jobs likewise, right, you know, he's a much more recent myth, so the myth hasn't reached the same outlandish proportions, but even so, you know, there are a lot of people who were, you know, instrumental, obviously, to making Apple Computer. It's not a one-man show. Um, and even, you know, as we'll see later, many of his ideas he took from other people. Um, because, in fact, you know, innovation is this great collective process. Um, but those myths are myths that uh, we don't necessarily understand as children. So, the favorite emotion in advertisers everywhere is awe. Awe is the emotion by which culture is transmitted from generation to generation. You are in awe of someone and so you blindly copy them. And in a hunter-gatherer tribe of 150 people, you would be in awe of somebody who is a great fisherman, or a great shaman, or a great cook, or whoever it was, and you would be in awe of them, and then you would go the 20, 30 meters across the village common to go spend time with them. You would dress like them, you would walk like them, you would try and imitate them, and then over the course of 10,000 hours, you would internalize everything they knew until you thought like them. The problem is that we now live in a large-scale society that is literally global. There are 7.5 billion people, and most of us don't meet our heroes. So we never realize that that image that, say, Edison or Jobs has created is just that. It's an image, and it doesn't reflect the actual reality. Take, for example, this amazing 1990s Michael Jordan uh, Coca-Cola ad. So this is what advertisers have figured out. They understand that you can be in all of Michael Jordan because he's amazing at basketball. And then they literally just have to put a soda can next to his head. And that you then are like, oh, I want to be like Mike, so I'm going to drink sugar water. Because clearly that's how Michael Jordan became the greatest athlete in the world. Or, oh, he has puffy shoes with his name on it. That's how he's the greatest basketball player in the world. I'm going to wear the puppy <laughs> shoes with his name on it. Those are great shoes, dude. Uh, but, you know, that is, that is that blind copying mechanism, and they've tapped into this in order to be able to sell things. So, obviously, this is not the real thing. This is not Michael Jordan on an average training day when he's eating whatever athletes ate in the 90s. Um, but, you know, kids don't know that. So you blindly copy that myth, and you don't understand that it's advertising. 
And there's a real price and a real toll to this. So there's obviously recently there's sort of been this awareness of the photoshopping of models and the ways in which that creates unrealistic expectations. Um, because, you know, young girls in particular people tend to blindly copy the people that they want to emulate or be like. Um, and so, you know, we don't understand this and they make themselves sick. You know, anorexia, bulimia, all sorts of body dysmorphia can come out of these Photoshop models. And, you know, there are some of the photos that are online. As adults, we look at them like there's this one that I love of like this, this woman who has like a giraffe neck. Like, it's just incredibly long. Um, and obviously, you know, as an adult, you know that's not humanly possible. But remember that we were all once kids. And kids are dumb, and they don't know a lot. And so they often will fall for these images and fall for these hype. And it takes us a long time to realize that, wait a minute, that image wasn't actually what's going on. So there's a great movie analogy for this that's a really, really easy way to understand this. It's from The Wizard of Oz. Um, and, uh, you know, it's my mother's favorite movie, because she's from Kansas. Um, so, you know, I think this is, uh, this is just a really good way to explain the, co the, the concept. This is really good. You are around the wrath of the great and powerful eyes. I said, come back tomorrow. If you are really great and powerful, you keep your promises. Do you presume to criticize the great odds? You ungrateful creatures, think yourselves lucky that I'm giving you audience tomorrow instead of 20 years from now. Oh, the great odds has spoken. So, oh, pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. The great odds has spoken. Who are you? For I, I am the great and powerful wizard of Oz. You are? Uh, I don't believe you. No, I'm afraid it's true. There's no other wizard except me. Be you humble. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly so. I'm a humble. Oh, you're a very bad man. <laughs> and the point is, is that that is a beautiful solution of what genius myths are, right? You know, there's this great booming voice, there's this incredibly well-crafted image, and then behind it, there's a man behind the curtain pulling all the levers, pulling all the knobs, generating that image. Um, I'm sure that, you know, and in the age of social media, I don't have to explain this to you guys. You guys all know this. But what you have to understand is, is that, you know, this is something that's been happening for a very long time, 10,000 years or more, right? Pharaoh did it, you know, the Chinese emperors did it, the kings of England did it, the Pope did it, and so did Edison, so did Mozart, so did Einstein, so did Newton. And the thing is, is that, you know, those myths uh, are like a game of telephone. They've just been passed on for generation and generation and generation, and they get more and more outlandish. And most people have just never bothered to be their own Toto, to look behind the curtain. And if you guys know Carol Dweck, who works on growth mindset and all this, this is one of the assignments that she gives her students, is to pick somebody who you think you could never be, and then look behind the curtain. Find out what they actually did. That's the point. You don't have to believe me. And so in the mixed mental arts community, we often have nicknames. My nickname is Toto. Um, and so my job is to pull back the curtain. But I can't get you to look, Dorothy, you're going to have to do that for yourself. So really, I can't encourage you enough to do that. If you start to read some of these autobiographies, instead of being in awe of this person, what you will find is you will find that there are lessons to be learned, practical lessons that you can apply as a playbook. Um, but the worst idea ever is, is that there are magical humans, and that some people are you know, born geniuses or naturally good at these things. And that doesn't fit the, you know, those myths don't fit the reality of the research. So, uh, you guys will probably, you're more likely to recognize this young man. Uh, that's Michael Jackson, uh, back in his Jackson 5 days. And over there we have Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, little Wolfie. And these patterns repeat again and again throughout history. And these two have very much the same story. So uh, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart's father was the premier violin teacher in Europe at the time, and he basically realized that a great money-making scheme was to take his children, make them practice violin and piano all day, and then go out and perform all over Europe. 
And the Mozart twins, Nan Earl, his older sister, and little Wolfie, would do all these concerts, and they had all sorts of tricks. And one of the famous tricks was that you know Leopold, his father, would basically ask somebody to give a piece of music that Mozart had never seen, Wolfgang had never seen, and then Mozart would play it from sight, right? And uh, one of the composers who did this, he wrote up a piece of music, he handed it over, and then what happened was that Wolfgang played the first couple of bars and then transitioned into a totally different piece. And so it was seamless. There was no break in the music. And only the composer knew that the piece of music being played was not the piece of music that was being written. So it's a magic trick. It was a very effective magic trick. But it did two things. This childhood did two things for Mozart. One, it built his reputation. He was famous throughout Europe. And two, he actually got an amazing musical training. When you're practicing that much and performing that much, you end up becoming very good at these things so that you've you know, established these fundamentals, and then you have the freedom to go improvise. So when you then go out and try and compose, you actually are quite innovative. And that sounds an awful lot like Michael Jackson. Joe Jackson, you know, stage dad, you know, practice, lots and lots of kids. By the time he gets to young Michael, he's really figured out how you both make amazing musicians and utterly psychologically fuck up your kids. And uh, the result is that, you know, by the time Michael is, you know, reaching his, you know, teens, 20s, he's done his 10,000 hours, and he really is innovative. And then on top of that, you know, he organizes a team of people around him who are his songwriters, his hit machines. And very often when you look closely at these sort of these big figures, you'll find that what they really did was they Steve Jobs or Thomas Edison that, and they have like a huge factory of writers, musicians, all that around them. So they're the figurehead of the cult, but they are not like the source of all the ideas. So. Michael's worked on the toggle with the Oh yeah, that might be easier. Eliminate uh, my need to learn PCs. Um, so uh, the, this pattern also plays out with genius myth. So I got this amazing image from Mental Floss, um, which is you know the sort of place that generates these sort of great clickbaity stories. Um, and you know, in the time of Isaac Newton, when they were trying to popularize gravity, a man by the name of Voltaire, who you may have heard of. Uh, so Voltaire basically wanted to displace the ideas of Descartes on gravity, and he wanted to popularize the ideas of Newton. And he, you know, Voltaire basically realized that you don't sell the math, you sell the myth, you sell the man. And so he built this cult of personality around Newton, and you know, it's from Voltaire. Voltaire seems like the most likely origin of the Newton apple story, uh, which is this sort of story of divine inspiration. And people are like, oh my god, Like all this time we thought that Descartes was right, but now it's Newton. And then that exact same playbook was played out hundreds of years later with a young uh, Austrian uh, patent clerk by the name of Albert Einstein. So when they then wanted to displace the ideas of Newton, they were like, this new boy wonder has created this new science. It's going to throw out the old one. And they built and they hyped and hyped and hyped and hyped, you know, like the Mayweather uh, the, the main letter Conor McGregor fight, and then, you know, oh my god, pay-per-view, tune in. In Africa, they're going to be gathering this stuff about this eclipse, and if the eclipse turns out this way, then it means Newton is done, and then Einstein is here. Of course, it doesn't really mean Newton is done. If you actually talk to a physicist, you know, we still use Newtonian mechanics. They're just different levels of approximation, and you use them for different levels of specificity. But it's great storytelling. And it's really, if you want to move these ideas, that's how you do it. The problem is, is that most of us never learn enough physics to be able to evaluate the contributions of either of these people. We don't look at how the community that was around them was building these ideas. Right? Newton famously said, if I have seen further, it is because I've stood on the shoulders of giants. And there's a huge group of people who were sharing all these ideas back and forth. Um, and famously, he... Uh, basically erased one of them from history, Robert Hooke. Uh, Robert Hooke was his great rival, and then Robert Hooke pissed him off. So he went through the Principia Mathematica, and every time Robert Hooke's na name appeared, it said the esteemed Robert Hooke, and he pissily went through and crossed out esteemed every time. 
And then there was a portrait of Robert Hooke, which disappeared in a fire. So we actually don't even know what Robert Hooke looks like. So you know what you end up with is you end up with an image of how these people actually were that is decidedly human. And so this is the book that Voltaire wrote, Elements of the Philosophy of Newton. And that is what is called the frontispiece, which is basically the first image. And you can see Newton is depicted as sitting on a cloud like God, with light coming down. Voltaire there is the humble writer who just puts down all these thoughts that have been inspired by this Godhead. And then there's this woman sitting over there on this cloud. Now, who is this woman? Well, that is a woman by the name of Emily du Chapelier, who was Voltaire's mistress. Because it turns out that Voltaire wasn't actually very good at math, and he needed somebody to tutor him in the math so that he could write this book. So, you know, we have myths today like women aren't good at math. But here is this, you know, little historical nugget that's like, oh wait, the math is actually being done by a woman. That's even why we even really, Newton's work got popularized. So what you're seeing here is you're seeing that humans have not changed since the time of hunter-gatherers. We have a rich mythic system. There are gods, there are demons, you know, there's lots and lots and lots of stories. But the problem is, is that for so long we've internalized these myths and just taken them as fact, rather than asking, what is this myth based on? Like, does this story actually check out? Does it fit what we really know? And remember that when you actually listen to what the geniuses themselves said, they said that their great secret was realizing that the world was built by people no smarter than you. And just think about how that would cause you to behave. If on day one of school, you had been told the world was built by people no smarter than you, and you can remake it any way that you want. And that's why this is the book we wish we had in high school, because that's what we should have been told first. So all of this, if you want, you know, you can dig back into the original academic research. So Patricia Farrow wrote this book, Newton, The Making of Genius, and it's all about, uh, you know, the various myths that have existed of Newton over time. So the Apple one is the one that has survived to the present day, but they had all sorts of weird ones. There was this one about Newton's dog, Diamond, um, and basically Newton's dog, Diamond, ate his homework at some point, and supposedly this, there was this great piece of physics that was lost the world, and then Newton has this clever line, oh, Diamond, if you knew what you had done, da 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 But that myth just died. Like, Diamond the dog is no longer. Right? Like that myth died out, but this Apple one has sort of stuck with us, right? So you can see this all in microcosm and social media. Things trend and then they fall off. And it's the same thing over time, stories have trended and fallen off. Um, but, you know, really, this is the one that uh, Voltaire actually cared about, right? He wanted a who wore a best competition between Voltaire and Newton, where we were like, yeah, Newton is the best. I'm Team Newton. And it's all the same old high school social dynamics, but played out on the grandest possible scale. Quick question, Mr. Smith. Yeah. I have a question uh, based on this. So with this concept of, of genius myths and hero worshiping, um, I'm going to turn it over to you guys for just a second to talk, talk amongst yourselves. And you kind of asked the question to think about the implications of the first day of school, if you had been told, or maybe you had been, maybe you hadn't been, that you know, the, the world is built by people no greater than yourselves. Right. If you've been told that, what are the implications? But the thing I'm curious about as well is, what are the implications of genius myths for, for students? And so if, if we're told in our society, and if there's some sort of cultural transmission that's telling us that there's these people who've done amazing things because they're geniuses, what is the implication for students in terms of what they perceive their ability to do similar things are? How problematic is that? Do you see that in your classrooms? Have you experienced it yourself? Are there other genius myths that you can even think of? You identified a contemporary with something like Michael Jordan or Michael Jackson or, or Steve Jobs. Who else is out there right now that, that we have a sort of genius myth that happens in society? So take, take a couple minutes, talk amongst yourselves, and then let's share back out before we move on to the next slide. Feel free to talk. So I know I threw a bunch of things out there. To talk, about, to talk about genius myths. What are the implications in society for that now? How does it impact school? Are you? Yeah. No, no, I think. Well, no, because I think it's like. Uh,
know. I think that's a thing, though, right? And that's the problem is that, like, I'm not using it. I'm sorry, I cannot. Oh, no, it's all right. It's all right. Um, so, oh, really? I forgot to buy it. Oh, no, no, no. I hear the I think it's a toggle. Yeah, the arrows are Yeah, the arrows are Yeah, Yeah, the arrows are Yeah, Yeah, the So one, one voice up at the front. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I don't mean to interrupt you. I'm glad that you guys are talking. That's, that's, that's what we want. We want. We want ideas to be exchanged. But we do also have limited time. So we want to make sure that we get through all of Hunter's presentation here. What were some of the things that you were sharing about in terms of this conversation about the implications of Euromain and genius and what the impact that has? Yeah, Angelique. Well, we were just talking about like the shame aspect. Mm -hmm. And we were, we were literally like comparing our stories how like, okay, like we have the of selling of success, like and nobody shares the struggling process of it. Nobody shares that. Like I just, um, like for example, we'll be in class, we'll be answering everything, and other students are like, "How do you do that? You're so smart." You just, and he's like, "You don't understand." I was just crying last night about this whole essay I had to write, and I just did it, and like I like was struggling through it and struggling to learn it, right. and like. Um, and she was talking about her story, how like not even knowing what basic MLA is, and just struggling to learn it. So like that shame aspect is something that can hinder people. That um, always seeing the successful part of the, of the product, and like just being discouraged, like oh, 
you know, I just I can't do it. I'm stupid. I can't do it. So that's a yeah. perfect a perfect example in, in the book, and, and I'm sure Hunter will touch on it too. It's the idea of unfair comparisons. Mm -hmm. um, and so yeah, oh, oftentimes we just see something on the surface. We don't actually see the ten thousand hours that happened before. Is everybody familiar with the ten thousand hour rule? Before, yeah. Eric Anders research that came out of Florida, this idea that you know the best folks have sort of put 10,000 hours in into their practice. So if you're going to be an awesome violin player, if you're going to be an awesome tennis player, if you're going to be an awesome fill in the blank, it's not going to happen magically. Obviously, it's the work that you do. But also the research teaches out that it's not any 10,000 hours. You can't just do the same sort of practice over and over. But I hit my 10,000 hours. I am now awesome. It's a certain particular type of practice, uh, which I think we'll talk about as well. Um, any other thoughts about this genius myth, or any other genius myths that are contemporary right now that you guys talked about? That, you know, something that we sort of see in society, and it's like, here's this amazing person that we, we just elevate to this unbelievable level without really talking about everything that got them to work. Yeah, sort of. Because Almost idolatry of Jesus. So people come in and it's like, well, you're obviously you're knowledgeable. You work in this lab. You're deemed an expert to be here. Um, and then it really, I think, frames an interesting responsibility that the leaders have in terms of how open and transparent can we be as far as sharing what our process was to get to where we're at, and make sure that you know we're sort of the proverbial toto and pulling the curtain back on ourselves all the time. And say, no, it's obviously that I wasn't born with the, the math gene or the language gene. It was all the work. That we're all right, interesting. Sir. Fantastic. I think you guys have been looking at my slides because you have anticipated a number of things that are coming up. But, uh, you know, we'll, we'll let that emerge. Windows is not genuine. Scott, I think you hey. found out that you're pirating software. That's our <laughs> district IT. Um, so, yeah, so what this all comes down to is advertising, right? And, you know, the, on the left, you sort of have the version of the myth, the, the genius myths that are heard that are very much as seen on TV, ShamWow. Uh, you know, they're amazing ads to get you to buy either people's inventions, whether it's light bulbs or iPhones, uh, you know, concert tickets, whether it's, you know, in the 1700s or in the 2000s. And then finally, to buy blindly into mathematical or scientific ideas that you don't necessarily understand, but you're just sort of like, Newton, Einstein, um, really, really smart. And then there's the reality, right? And, you know, Newton in particular, you know, spent 20 years in this weird garden shed in Cambridge working on this stuff. Also, the things people never talk about with Newton are the fact that Newton had three great passions. The first was calculating the age of the Earth based on the Bible. Comes out to about 6,000 years, guys. Um, and then the second one is alchemy. Dude loved alchemy. Uh, he had a lot of mercury exposure. Not a thing I would recommend. And then the third was uh, natural philosophy, which is what we would today call science. And the funny thing is, is that a lot of people actually think that his alchemy work was vital to his gravity work. Because gravity is actually super weird. The idea that you know Earth and the Sun can have a gravitational relationship without touching is magic. And Descartes' whole theory of gravity was based around these vortices that were interacting and touching. And Newton was like, yeah, of course there's magic. Like, stuff doesn't need to touch. Like, I'm an alchemist. And so it was his alchemy that actually helped him to make that conceptual leap. Um, but we don't hear those stories until now. Um, so. In general, human thinking, if we look at the long, long view, for, for, you know, progresses from magic, right, where we're like, we don't understand why things happen, they just do, and then we fill in with some sort of story about a god, right, Thor, Zeus, you know, there's no shortage of those, to science, where we start to understand why and how things actually happen, to engineering, where it's like, oh, now that we get how this electricity stuff works, now we can make it something that we control, that is replicable, and we literally put lightning into a bottle. 
The amazing thing is that we are now making here this transition from science to engineering in terms of human potential. We actually haven't understood very well for most of human history how humans really learn. And now we're actually finally starting to get the real clarity on a much, much, much deeper level. And it's going to require real societal changes. Because the reality is you can make a lot of money by hijacking people's awe mechanisms to sell stuff. But the consequence for our society where you do that are extremely negative. And, you know, as a community, we have to start to look at, okay, great, you can sell a bunch of clothes by photoshopping images of models, but you're going to give a whole bunch of girls bulimia, anorexia, and all sorts of eating disorders. You can, you know, sell a whole bunch of merchandise by building this myth of your own success um, of how you just sort of, like, are an eyebot. But kids are going to buy into that, and it's going to, you know, affect the way that they approach school, so their own path to success. I mean, we talked last time about, do you want to share about your brother? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, I, I was the first in my family to go to college, and so when it was his turn to go to college. He started here at Valley, and then he was like, why do I got to come here to work to Valley when I just go and work with my buddies and make more money now than I would, um, maybe when I graduate, they tell me there are no jobs anyway. And so he had it off, and, and he was like, by the way, Steve Jobs dropped out of school. You know, Bill Gates dropped out of school. So I'm going to drop out of school and be an entrepreneur and start my own blog. And you, and now he's gone through, like, wanting to be a YouTube star and <laughs> all these different things. And he's starting to now to mature because he's 25, not 19 anymore. But he's like, maybe next semester you can help me go back to college is the conversation we had last weekend. So, so what's your brother's name? Uh, Christian. Christian. So yeah. there you go, Christian. There is a very real concrete example of the consequences of the mm -hmm. genius myths that Steve Jobs built to sell iPhones, right? And, you know, the, the point is, is that, yes, absolutely, all of this stuff plays out within a classroom, but it also plays out within the grand classroom of a global society. And, you know, it's one thing to be able to, like, walk across the classroom and say, or go to the tutor and say, how did you do this? I don't get how you did this. Like, can you explain to me? But, you know, Christian doesn't get the opportunity to walk over to Steve Jobs and be like, hey, Steve, what's the deal? How'd you build <laughs> Apple, right? And he's like, ah, it wasn't a thing. It really wasn't, you know. It was a lot of work. Like, let's be clear. Like, it was a lot of work. But here were the things I did. You actually, the world was built by people no smarter than you, so you could actually do this. So these genius myths have a real, real societal consequence. And, you know, before we can start to hold people accountable on those, we first have to let people even really understand them. Um, so that, you know, we can start to ask, you know, hey, you made, you know, and the thing I always think about, this is terrible, but I always think about Tupac's changes, because he has that great line, you made a G today, but you made it in a sleazy way, and that's really a lot of what this comes down to. There's a lot of money to be made with these ads, but, you know, if you're literally screwing up kids, uh, that's pretty messed up. So in terms of that science that we're only just starting to get, like, why do humans think magically? And so this is an intelligence test for a chimpanzee, an orangutan, and a human toddler. Guys, I have some bad news. That first column is actually spatial intelligence, where we are slightly smaller, smarter than chimps. Quantities, we're actually, that's math, we're dumber than chimps at first. Uh, causality, figuring out why things happen. So science, we are dumber than chimps at first. Uh, and there's only one area in which we're off the charts. Social intelligence. Humans are the socially intelligent primate. We are off the charts intelligent in terms of social intelligence. This is why we love soap operas. This is why we love Game of Thrones. This is why we are constantly tracking the dynamics in a high school cafeteria. Because we are alive and alert to relationships. And uh, what ends up happening, though, is that that's not necessarily how our world is structured. It's not based on these assumptions, which is what the science actually says. It's based on these old enlightenment ideas of, you know, rationality or something like that. And so what ends up happening is, is that if you actually look at how the science is structured, you know, we've talked about the straight conspiracy and mixed mental arts. Well, the best analogy, analogy for what the 60 million scientific papers look like is this. So there's a famous story that comes out of India and the Sufi world uh, of the blind men and the elephant. So a group of blind men come across this thing. They don't know what it is. They decide to figure out what it is. And so the first blind man walks up to the, the tank. He feels the end of it. He feels these little hairs. And he screams out to his fellows, It's a rope! 
And then the second blind man walks up to the other end and grabs the trunk and it wriggles in his hands and he jumps back scared and he says, it's a snake! And then the next one feels the side, he decides it's a wall, another guy feels the leg, decides it's a trunk, the ear is a fan, and then the tusk is a, is a spear. And then what happens is they all declare that clearly the other ones are idiots. And they all start to beat the shit out of each other because clearly they see the world as it really is and everyone else is a moron. And originally this story was told about religion, but actually it's a great summary of how academia works. Um, so all of these different disciplines, whether it's psychology or biology or biochemistry or physics or math or social sciences or anything like that, they're all talking about reality. This big elephant that is out there that is large and complex, but very often academics can get caught up in debates about like terminology and they end up talking past each other. Or they're so lost in their little piece of the elephant that they never bother to wander around and see what else is being figured out. So one of the things that, you know, when we were making the transition from the Brian Callen show to Mixed Mental Arts, one of the things that really drove that was there's a very, very uh, amazing evolutionary biologist at Binghamton named David Sloan Wilson. And he studies multi-level selection. And he's aware of this problem of science not moving and being packed together. And so back in, I think, 2014, he sent me an email saying, I really want you to read this piece that I've written that hasn't been released yet, and it's called Towards a Science of Intentional Behavior Change. And it's 90 pages long. Well. And I, at this point, am very much still in awe of these academics, and so I diligently read the 90-page paper. And at the end of the 90-page paper, I say, I feel like what you're talking about here is the diffusion of innovations. Have you read it? And he responds back. He says, oh, I have, of course, heard of Everett Rogers' classic work, but have not made a close study of it. And I'm like, so you haven't read it? He's like, no. Right? <laughs> and the diffusion of innovations is about how ideas move. It's five to 600 pages long, and it was written in 1967. It is an innovation that has not diffused. And that's because although it is about how ideas move, it is written in that dry academic style that is the cultural norm within academia. And so the reality is that these books have very often been sitting around for 50 years or more and have not moved. And in fact, a lot of these sort of myths or ways of thinking about intelligence really date back to the eugenics movement. Um, which is over 100 years old, and you know that Carol Dweck's whole focus with growth mindset is to finally undo the damage of that. But you know the tragedy is that for so long the answers have existed, but they're so scattered about, and they're in this form that we don't even realize that they've been there all the time. So the key to solving that is tapping into social learning, which is what we're good at. So the six blind men, or however many blind men, the seven and a half billion blind people, have the ability to figure out the elephant if they learn from each other. And we now have the tools to be able to do that, obviously, with the internet and with social media. And while, you know, up until now, they've mostly been used for cat videos, um, which is a noble and legitimate use of social media. I don't want to, you know, rag on cats. Um, but, you know, there are other things we can use them for like starting to chip away at this problem of what does all this information add up to. And there are 60 million scientific papers and 130 million books. So the reason why we started the Mixed Metal Arts Project is because the guy from Hangover and the old school, right, and a tutor in LA are not going to be able to figure out all 60 million scientific papers on their own. We have to get a group of people who are fed up with humanity ganging up on each other and are more interested in ganging up on the problem of how do we make sense of the world and how do we create the society we have always wanted. Um, and you know, the joke that Brian makes, because we grew up all over the world, is that we saw great poverty from inside an air-conditioned car. And that was our childhood. And uh, you know, I would like, before I leave this place that we call Earth, to fix that. Um, and I think that you know, we have the information and the potential to be able to do that. But it's really going to have to be a team effort, because that's a lot of scientific papers. OK, so part two of the book. The three things you need to know about your brain. So there are really three things that you need to know in order to understand how to learn anything that you want. The first is automaticity. So this is just if you do anything often enough, it becomes automatic. So you can see you have neurons in your brain and throughout your body. Congratulations. 
As you do things, what happens is they become myelinated. So they become wrapped in this insulating material, um, and that insulating material basically speeds up nerve conduction, right? And so all of your nerve pathways get stronger and stronger. If you do a lot of it, say 10,000 hours, you ultimately end up at lots and lots of myelin. So you've really grooved those pathways. You can get really, really good at anything you want. Um, and the fact that you, know, you can walk, you can talk, you can do all these things, we know that you can automate things. There are many things that you have automated. If we compare you as a toddler, we compare you now, you have automated many, 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 many things. And there are other things that you can automate. So let's look at, though, how uh, that works. So you know, the analogy that we use, and you, know, you reference this in terms of being a tutor, it sort of seems magical because it's so fast and so easy for you. But you know, at first, you know, it's like trying to get your way to a gold mine in the jungle. Right? There's really no path, you have to hack through, you need the machete, it's hard work, right? But as you go to the gold mine and you come back, you start to beat a path through the jungle. And then if you keep doing that, ultimately, that path becomes like a super highway. It's super easy for you to do those things. And if you think about you know, the experience of learning to count or learning to read, right? I mean, I don't particularly remember learning to read, but I have seen children learn to read and it clearly at some point was a struggle, right? But we've now all been doing it for so long that it's not a big deal, and we sort of take these things for granted. Now, suddenly ask me to start writing Chinese, and I suddenly remember how hard it is to learn a new language, right? So we are always rewiring our brains. We always have the ability to rewire it. But what happens is, is that, again, like so much of this comes down to, as you said, not seeing the process or forgetting the process or not being aware of the process. And so we have to constantly remind ourselves and each other of that. So I brought these two back. Uh, there's a, the, the story that we use in the book. It's very much like what you're saying. Good work. You clearly looked through the pitch deck before. Um, but yeah, so you know, essentially imagine a girl, Jenny. She knows all the answers in class right away. Right, Phil is sitting there. He's not really paying attention to the teacher. He's paying attention to Jenny. And then he's like, how does she know all the answers? It's magic. It's that magical thinking. In practice, Jenny has been practicing, right? He just doesn't see that practice, and because he has very bad cognitive intelligence, like all of us, and doesn't know why things happen, his mind fills in with a story. Jenny is just naturally smart. Jenny is just, you know, has the math gene. And especially when you live in a culture that is saturated with stories about people like Steve Jobs and Thomas Edison, and the idea of these math and magical people, that's what his mind is likely to fill in with. And he maybe doesn't even realize that that's what he's been doing. And again, originally in the story, Phil and Jenny are five. So B, there are a lot of ideas you made up about your brain when you were five, like what you were good at and what you were bad at. And those myths have been elaborated. And now you're you know, 1920, and you've just sort of always believed this thing. And you don't realize that it all came back down to the fact that Jenny had done slightly more practice on her time statement. And that's why she was a little bit better. And that it actually wasn't that she was magical, even though you kind of felt that way. Um, so we don't, there's so much of studying relies on invisible work. We don't see the work, but that doesn't mean that it's not there. And that's especially true in anything that is mental. Because if you see your friend go out on the basketball court and practice a whole bunch, or you see your friend on the soccer field and he's kicking that corner kick again and again and again, you can see that practice. But if Jenny is sitting there and sort of planning out her essay in her head, right, it could just look like she's sort of staring off into space. You don't actually know that she's doing anything. So in mental endeavors, invisible work is particularly problematic. Um, now, the problem with magic is that magic doesn't work. I'm very sorry about this, guys. I know that this is heartbreaking to Harry Potter fans, but it doesn't. <laughs> now the question is, what is this? Well, there's a famous story that we love in the mixed metal arts community of the cargo cults. So in uh, Papua New Guinea, the people in the highlands of Papua New Guinea were cut off from sort of you know the hive mind of Eurasia uh, for about 10,000 years. They were you know used stone tools. They were hunter gatherers. And then suddenly, in around World War II, the United States begins on island hopping to try and get a bomber range of Japan. Now, imagine if you're a Stone Age person, and suddenly you see bombers flying overhead, giant plane, and they're dropping cargo out of the sky. I mean, this is mind-blowing. 
And then inside the cargo, there's spam. I mean, spam is delicious and calorie rich. There's metal, which you've never seen metal before. And there's all sorts of tools. So what happens is that, you know, because humans don't have very good causal intelligence, they try and come up with a story for how this works. So they go along to where these giant metal birds nest, and they see that, you know, these giant metal birds take off, and then they make this noise. So they go off into the jungle, and they build their own airplanes out of twigs and bark, and hundreds of men stand around these planes, and they go, and they wait for the twig airplanes to take off. Now, there are a couple of things that are important to notice about this. They got the superficial features of the plane right, because that's how all works. All works from blind copying from the outside in. So when you want to be like Michael Jordan, the first thing you do is wear his shoes, wear his jersey, do all of this. And so the point is that what you're seeing is you're seeing it's, you know, when you at first, like some people are like, oh, those people are dumb. And it's like, uh-uh, uh-uh, that's how you work. That's how we all work. That's how human beings work. And you have to understand how human beings work in, under, in order to understand why we, you know, think magic. And so even in a classroom, kids are often trying to repeat the magic ritual. And then I say words, right? And then somehow my words are wrong, but her words were right. I don't understand. And, you know, there are lots and lots of behaviors. Or, look, I'm sitting here with my books, and they're open, and I'm putting my eyes over the words. But they're not really breaking down the material or comprehending. So Phil and Jenny may both sit there in library, and they both have their books in front of them, but the invisible work that they're doing is totally different. And Phil doesn't realize that he believes in magic, that he's magically thinking about how learning works. Um, so what ends up happening is, is that over here, you know, this is another story of a girl named Jasmine trying to learn French, and you can see that, you know, what should happen is she should really focus on one thing, accuracy. That is your job, to be slow, to get it correct. Anybody who knows anything about the piano, which I don't really, but I've watched some movies where people learn to play piano, and there's always some mean teacher with a ruler, and every time the student tries to rush through the piano, they get slapped on the knuckles. So you have to focus on accuracy and precision. Uh, maybe learning to type is an analogy that people can appreciate, right? And it's about not rushing and about really grooving in those right habits. But instead, what happens is that a lot of people see, oh, the, what you're supposed to do is the hand is supposed to go up, and then you're supposed to vomit some words out. And so they just keep on vomiting words out, Right? We call it verbal vomit or verbal diarrhea. And then at a certain point, they're like, why doesn't my verbal vomit work? And this was my experience in high school, specifically around English. I did not understand punctuation. And my relationship with commas was that of sprinkles. I thought that basically commas were some sort of funfetti that you just like you wrote the essay and then you funfetti that shit. And, you know, for some reason my funfetti was inappropriately placed. I didn't understand. It seemed arbitrary, and it was clear that this was a you know bit of personal pique by my English teacher rather than some sort of fair and impartial rules that had evolved over hundreds of years. Um, so. This is actually how humans work. These are the sorts of things we do. We all do it. But once you understand that, then we can all sort of start to create a culture at Los Angeles Valley College where we're focused on slow and with control, where we're really focused on accuracy and grooving in the right habits so that ultimately we are fast and right. So uh, there is you know, reference to this motion of shame, which we'll talk about. But you know, the biggest thing is how do you view mistakes? How do you respond to mistakes? And you know, this is what Carol Dweck talks about with growth and fixed mindset. You know, do you essentially feel like you can't control your mistakes? There's nothing you will do that will ever fix it, and you get stuck in this endless loop of not fixing your mistakes. They just build up and build up and build up. Or do you just keep on fixing every little piece that you can? And that is really it's a leap of faith. Because you have to keep on fixing things and hoping that if you keep on debugging your own process that at some point, this sucker is going to work. So if you keep debugging your math or keep debugging your commas, that at some point you'll be able to reliably write without getting any red X's. 
Um, but it is really, I mean, that is most of what learning is about. And Scott referenced the fact that it's not just about 10,000 hours, but it's about 10,000 hours of very specific kind of practice. And Anders Ericsson calls this deliberate practice because you're always deliberately focusing on what's not working. Uh, in the straight A conspiracy, we call it fix it focus practice because we understand that most people don't have time to figure out what academics are talking about. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's basically the idea. Now, I mentioned Carol Dweck, she's great, I love her work. But what you'll often find with academics is that they have reinvented the wheel. So Dweck talks about growth and fixed mindset. But here is a prayer from Reinhold Niebuhr, sometimes known as a serenity prayer. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. The same thing is Dweck's work. And in fact, you can find earlier examples of this. You know, uh, Henry Ford, whether you think you can or whether you think you can't, either way you're right. It's about what you believe. And in fact, if you look at the culture of America for the first hundred years, it was dominated by an understanding of growth mindset. You had people like Booker T. Washington, Abraham Lincoln, Frederick Douglass, Benjamin Franklin, guys who didn't have a lot of resources, were quite poor, but had so much faith in their own potential that they relentlessly tried to improve. And that culture was a lot of the secret sauce of what made this country successful, and it was lost. And it was specifically lost, again, because of the eugenics movement. Um, specifically because Darwin's cousin was a man named Francis Galton, and Francis Galton read Darwin's theory of evolution, and as an English aristocrat, the conclusion that he came to was that clearly what the theory of evolution by natural selection means is that some people are just born better than others. <laughs> and so he wrote this book called Hereditary Genius, and that is really the germ of where this idea of genius myths really come from, this idea of magical people. But one of the things that you have to do is say, you know, in terms of thinking the world was really built by no, people no smarter than you, is that you have to have the confidence to then take these ideas and not be overly in awe of someone like Carol Dweck or any of the scientists who did this work. And understand that humans for a long time, in many cultures, in many times and places, have understood these ideas. And I'm giving you one expression of them, but I guarantee that if you look at any human culture around the world, you can find the ideas expressed in some other way. And we shouldn't get overly hung up on what the words are, because that's uh, the old problem of the blind men and the elephant. So, yeah, there's Henry Ford. I use that as well because I was just in Detroit, so the pitch deck is kind of Detroit slanted. Um, so, attention. Right, so attention, the ability to pay attention. And what you'll find is, is that you know, the relationship between automaticity and attention is really, that's the cornerstone of learning. So you know, if you think about learning, you put your attention on your ABC, and it's hard, and you struggle, and you're beating that jungle path, and then you automate your ABCs. And then, once you've automated your ABCs, you no longer need to think about them. Your attention is freed up to now think about words. When you struggle, 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 you automate those, and then you no longer have to think about them. Your attention is now freed up to think about grammar or sentences and ultimately about metaphor and all of that. But very often what we find with students is, is that a lot of those fundamentals aren't there. And if those fundamentals aren't there, then what happens is they're trying to do something when they haven't automated up those fundamentals, so their attention is then free. So, you know, and I think especially with that sort of evolution that you often see with kids, they may have checked out, you know, seventh grade, eighth grade, fourth grade, much earlier. Um, and therefore, you know, it's always worth sort of digging around. A lot of this is sort of just debugging, right? You're a physician, right? You're trying to figure out, okay, this patient's sick. Like, if you guys watch House? you guys watch House? Yeah. So the point is, the fun of House, as we'll see later, is that it's detective work, right? You know, this patient comes in, there's this mess of symptoms, and you have to figure out, okay, we're seeing this mess of symptoms, what's really going on? What is the root cause of this problem? Um, so yeah, so you know, often the term that's used is executive function. That's literally what it is. Your attention is the boss. And you have to manage your, your boss and figure out where you put your attention. And make sure, uh, you know, are you avoiding your mistakes or are you looking at them? Right? And again, you have to, you know, part of the challenge for a tutor is, is that it's like being a physician. You rely on reporting. So, you know, if I go into my doctor and, you know, my 
cholesterol is up, and there are all sorts of things that are happening. And then my physician's like, you working out? Are you eating properly? And I'm like, yeah, no pizza for this guy. Um, and so, you know, it's the same thing. You know, it's a lot of it requires on a real trust and a real relationship with the person you're working with, so that rather than trying to BS you, uh, they're actually telling you what's actually going on. Oh, I actually didn't study at all. That's why I failed this test. And they're like, great, maybe we try that. Or I actually have no idea how to study. Uh, okay, that's fine, no problem, right? And you know, obviously, I mean, uh, I'm sure you've all had conversations with your, I mean, you know, maybe it's just me. Anyway, there are there are things that I've had to tell physicians at some point that I would not want my mother to know. And you know, so it requires a certain level of comfort and trust there, where they know it's a safe space and we can be totally honest about what was going on, and then it's sort of like the confessional. This is not going to go anywhere else, it's not going to be discussed on social media. So, um, so brain areas recruited for reading, and this is actually from a guy named Turkle Talb, and you can see more and more of the brain is recruited over time uh, by this relationship between automaticity and attention. So you're literally rewiring your brain to become a reading brain. And there may actually be a toll to this, um, where you know essentially there's there's some suggestion that people who do a lot of reading, essentially a lot of their neural real estate is devoted to that, so they end up becoming terrible with names. Um, but this is, I think, what nutty professors use to justify just not caring about other people. Um, so, yeah, uh, he just made a point that resonated with me. You were talking about this idea of the trust between a patient and a doctor. And how oftentimes you know you share stuff with the doctor that perhaps you wouldn't share with your parent or whatever it may be. What's the analogy there with tutoring and a student? Why is it that a student might be more inclined to share something with a tutor than with his or her professor? With peers? Peers. Peer tutoring, right? And so the, the beauty of peer tutoring is that you are students, you can relate to the students coming in as students, and you are not grading anybody, right? Their grade is not contingent on your opinion of them. And so part of, of, of the thing that you want to embrace as a peer tutor is that very fact that you are a peer, that you are a student. You want to make sure that you're not playing too heavy on the authority side of things, that I have this information and that I'm more knowledgeable, clearly, right? The other thing that um, I think is critical to what you're saying is, as a tutor, how do you find out what the process is for the student? How do you find out that they weren't good at studying or that they're having this problem or that maybe there's something going on in their personal life that's complicating their ability to learn something? If they come in and you just jump into the session and they say, I'm not doing well, here's the problem that I have, here's my math problem, or here's my essay, let's go over it. And if you start grading or, or editing their paper, or if you start doing their math problem for them, you're missing the most important step. It's that opportunity to dig in and ask questions. It's, it's the Socratic method, right? How many questions can you ask within the tutoring session to find out about it? Well, how long did you study for? What was your study process like? What do your notes look like? What does your book look like in terms of how you might have read the book? How do you feel about that? How's things going in general for you? That's just a series of questions that that's really the sort of the diagnostic piece that a good doctor is that sort of person who will actually sit there and take a few minutes and have bedside manner, right, and get to know you a little bit. As opposed to the sort of clinic of an HMO where it's like come in, come out, come in, come out, come in, come out, come in, come out. Here's the prescription, you're done. Right? Is that really treating people, if we play out the, the medical sort of metaphor, is that really health? Is that really creating sort of a healthy culture, a healthy society? So, no, I, no, I think that's great, and I think the other thing that's worth recognizing is that all that personal life, right? I mean, this is some of what we talked about last time, like, a lot of you guys have to take the bus here, and that takes a whole bunch of hours. A lot of you people have kids, day jobs, right? All this stuff matters. I mean, I was just in Columbus, Ohio, and uh, somebody was telling me a story about a teacher, and there's this kid, he's clearly the, you know, bright, he's engaged in class, and he's not doing his homework, right? And so there might be the standard response there of like, you know, you need to do your homework. But she gets to know the kid, she spends some time with him, she earns his trust, she starts dropping him off back at home. Well, it turns out that his mom works two jobs, his father is an alcoholic, he never moves the bedroom. And then he literally has to sit in the kitchen with a baseball bat. This is like the kid who's like, you know, in second or third grade. Uh, because debt collectors are coming to try and collect money from his dad. And so that's his reality. And, you know, if we don't have that context, then we don't have the ability to actually help them. Because we're like, okay, clearly something larger and more drastic is required here. How do we deal with this? Um, 
So, you know, again, it's, a lot of this is about just recognizing how partial your information is, right? And how limited it is, and then, you know, like, you can't, you know, the, if anything, like, the, the balance of power is even more on the patient, the student, in education than it is in health. Because, you know, if, if you're a patient, I can draw blood, I can run work, I can get all sorts of numbers from you, and I can tell, you know, there are pizza molecules in your blood, like, you know you've been eating pizza, right? But I can't necessarily do that with a student. What well, really requires honest, vulnerable reporting on the student's part, and that requires creating that mutual respect, that trust, and that environment of not judging, and just trying to figure out the problem together. Um, so it's really about creating the right emotional space and the right relationship. And even last time, um, you know, we were talking about like one of the one of the tutors brought up the fact that you know she's a mom. And there are a lot, you know, she doesn't necessarily feel that she's necessarily the greatest math tutor, but it's the fact that she is a mom and she is understanding that she is patient. So a lot of people who normally wouldn't necessarily come into the Academic Resource Center were coming back and back and back and back to see her because of that relationship. Because again, social learning, that is our superpower. And the more we embrace our superpower and sort of let go of what our expectations are of that sort of HMO type of, uh, of care, the more we can actually start to move the ribbons. Um, so, you know, multitasking, right? Scott specifically asked me to do this. Uh, this is, uh, I tried to make a GIF. And apparently my GIF making skills, you know, I need to fix that, I need to work on that, so I will. But it's just the girl blowing the bubble from the first Bueller clip. And, you know, the simple analogy that Katie and I use to sort of debunk multitasking is, let's say that you're, can you walk along the street? Yes, you can. Can you walk along the street and can you read a book? No. Yeah, now it starts to get a little bit more challenging, right? Can you walk along the street and talk on the cell phone? Yes. Yes. Can you walk along the street, talk on the cell phone, and chew gum? Yes. Can you walk along the street, talk on the cell phone, chew gum, and read a book? No. Done. <laughs> you see, we all very quickly get like, oh, multitasking, right? It's actually not that easy. And really what it comes down to is the breakdown between what's automated and what's not automated, right? What really requires attention? And when we start to, you know, the point is that when you're talking about reading a book, that requires a lot of attention, right? And it requires real focus. And when you're trying to do two things and people think they're multitasking, really their attention is switching back and forth, back and forth. Uh, texting on your cell phone and driving. Um, and in fact, there is a time lag uh, for the brain of about two seconds as you're doing that switching. Um, and that's why the response time of texting and driving is comparable to being drunk and driving. Um, it's really, really bad. And so it actually, in terms of you know, error rate, it doubles your error rate. So these are just the sort of simple tools that we can offer you to walk students quickly where, okay, we did that in 30 seconds. Now you know multitasking is BS. So why don't you realize that you're actually wasting your time and hurting yourself when you are spending your time trying to even multitask? Like, the big one is always people want to listen to music and work, right? You know, maybe, you know, to some extent for some kinds of work, like when I was doing some of the Photoshop for this book, music was helpful because it wasn't something that was particularly cognitively demanding and allowed me to, you know, sort of just get into doing what was fairly routine work. But you're really trying to focus on a tough essay or a tough passage. Um, so here is an example of like how do you actually use attention and how do you run into problems. So you know, this is a student. She has this question: Is the reaction between potassium and water exothermic? But she's overwhelmed, right? She's got a million thoughts in her head, all these different things that she has to do, right? And so in practice, her attention is ping-ponging between all these different things. And first thing, you have to be like, okay, that's great. You need to get those out of your head. So one of the things is that, you know, we humans come equipped with what's called an internal nag. If you know that you have something to do, like pay your taxes, <laughs> it's going to keep on nagging you and nagging you and nagging you until you do it. And so you have to get that out of your head. One way is to write down everything you have to do so you have a list that you can later work through, right? Then the nag leaves you alone. The other thing that's super helpful from David Allen is do, dump, or delegate. If it takes less than two minutes, do it. 
if you're never going to do it, like that, you know, idea for a novel that you've had for four years that you know has never gotten done, double it. Except it's not going to happen, and that there are other projects. And then if it is something that you know you can delegate, delegate, get it off your plate. So if you're working on a project with people, great. My job is to write the outline for this movie. So I get the outline done, boom, now it's on my teammates. Now it's no longer my problem. So my attention is free. So you get to the question where you're just focused on, at the stage where you're just focused on the question. But then in practice, what happens is that you know people often stare at the question as a whole. Not how human attention works. You have to isolate the different pieces, the different parts. Okay, so exothermic, what does that mean? First, let's clarify what that is. Exo, out, therm, heat, gives out heat. Okay, now that's clear. Okay, potassium and water. Which one's potassium again? I have to clear that up. And then you unpack each of those bricks until you get clear, oh, they're asking, does that metal thing we saw in class where we threw it on the water and it blew up to give out heat? Yeah, it blew up. Great, yes. Right? But it is this process that there are all these steps that are involved in getting to the answer. And again, this magical thinking, very often students think you just stare at the question and then out emerges the answer. Because that's literally what they see. Um, so part of that is demystifying that process and then giving them a reality check on how do human brains actually work. Um, so emotions, it's the third thing you need to know about your brain. So, you know, you're, sometimes your brain is totally calm, and then sometimes you get angry. Uh, and your brain goes nuts, and everything goes out the window, right? So, the emotions drive attention, and then attention controls automaticity. So this is really, you know, the workflow. If you're in a state of fear, I'm so scared I couldn't think, deer in the headlights, your attention shuts down. If you are calm, then you are receptive, and information can go into your brain. Right? I've been fed, I've had a nap, Scott rubbed my back a little, it's all great, and now I'm really ready to learn, I'm fired up. Right? So the emotions matter hugely, and we have all these different emotions. And what you can do is you can reset them, and you can tell a different story about them. And the last time I was here, uh, one of the people in the community came up with this great thing that she'd gotten for her professor, the test is not aligned. And so, you know, the test can seem scary. You can be super scared of it. But in practice, practice it as squiggles on a piece of paper. And in practice, all of those answers exist in your textbook online. And in practice, you have automaticity, and you know you can learn. And therefore, if you do the right kind of practice, no different from playing a video game or doing anything else, if you do enough practice, you'll be good at it, and then you will beat the level. You will beat the test. So you tell yourself a different story, Humans do this all the time, and then you get yourself to chill out so that you are chill enough to be able to then handle the situation. Right? It's okay. The test is not aligned. And in practice, we all have a set of these stories, but part of it is that we could create a community where we pool these stories. We all share our best stories, our best resets. And you're going to find that there are lots of them out there. And you know, here's one from the Los Angeles Valley College community that I believe she got from her professor that was super helpful to her. Yeah, and I think um, when she explained it, it's Sandy, who's one of the tutors. She unpacked this metaphor a little bit in terms of sort of what happens at a physiological level with fear, right? So if you're literally seeing a lion, like imagine a lion came in front of this room right now, all of a sudden, lion's running around the room. <laughs> What's your physiological response to that? Like on a biological level, what happened? <laughs> Fight or flight. So if you feel like you're going to flight, the blood's going to run down to your feet, right? So you can get out and move. Right? Also, what's going to happen, if, this actually happened to my cat. I had a kitten who was like three months old. We had a St. Bernard. She was a St. Bernard. St. Bernard's kind of crazy. She got a hold of the cat in the mouth. What did the cat do? Played Defecated. <laughs> All over. It's the same sort of thing that happens in terms of fear. So when you get really scared, if you feel like your life is going to be in danger and you have to run, blood rushes to your feet, animals will defecate because it makes them lighter. You can run faster. So what, some, what Sandy was saying, what happens is that the, the emotions get mixed up. So when people say they have test, test anxiety and they have to go take that math test, and all of a sudden they get sick to their stomach and they can't think, they're having the response of fear that's so intense that it's almost like a lion is there. It's the wrong emotional response. For that context. For that context. 
So none of these, what you're going to find is that, you know, like Scott and I have talked about this a lot, it's all of these emotions evolve for a particular function, right? Like lions or snakes or whatever, right? So they all have a function. They're all positive and they're all useful in the right environment, right? And so it would be, if, the, if a lion did show up here, it would be an excellent response to get the hell out of Gosh. Might even be great to cook yourself. Because then you're going to be one of the faster ones and not be the student who gets eaten, right? But the point is that doing that in a math test is really kind of problematic, being the one who pooped yourself and ran away, right? Like, you will go down in Los Angeles Valley College history. So it's about context and environment where these emotions are appropriate and useful. Um, and you used the most important word earlier, shame, right? So let's take a look at this uh, epi classic episode from The Simpsons. Everyone did well on this test except Lisa Simpson, F. An F? Okay, this is the time when I always wake up. Come on, alarm clock, get me out of here! <laughs> Sorry, Lisa, this F is all too real. No, it's not, Tree Hoover, and as long as I'm asleep, I'm going to have some fun! I can fly! <laughs> this isn't a dream. I really did fail. I take no joy in this. Well, it's perfect. Aww. So, you know, the, the point is, is that, you know, although, you know, in a sort of abstract world, yes, embracing and analyzing our mistakes, fixing them is what we should do, right? Very often we have feelings about mistakes. And specifically, the feelings that we have are shame. That's the big one. So there's a reason why we say, I feel stupid, and it is because stupid is a feeling. It is the emotion of shame. And shame, just as you know, fear can motivate things like fight or flight or defecation, um, you know, shame motivates very specific behavior, which is avoidance. So you know, I, you know, way, way back when we first started tutoring, one of the things that we found again and again is that students had taken their bad tests they had wadded them up, they had thrown them away, they had buried them in the bottom of their backpack. And in fact, when I was in high school, I did this same thing. Um, I, uh, you know, had somehow picked up this idea that I wasn't very good at math, and then I, but I liked science, so I was like, biology and chemistry are fine, but physics is the mathy science, so I'm probably going to be less good at this. And so then I went into the class already nervous, already anxious, there was this kid named Phil Hand who sat in the front row. He would literally bring a newspaper to class and a cup of coffee and like just act super chill and be like, oh yeah, whatever, whatever. And I don't know why the teacher put up with this behavior, um, but the point is that I was already nervous and feeling insecure and then Phil, right, was like just sort of apparently breezing through this whole thing while the rest of us are dying. And I was like, just got into this tiswaz Studied really hard, got the test back, the test was a disaster. So I buried it in the bottom of my folder. Again, second test, third test. And it was getting to the stage where in high school I really wanted to go to Harvard. And so I was like, this one grade, this damn physics grade, is going to tank my whole transcript. So I better do something to fix it. So I went back to my shame hole, otherwise known as my room, and uh, I got out all these tests and started to look through what was going on with them. And it turned out that I couldn't read my own handwriting. Um, what had happened was is that I would write down the calculation, but my fours looked like nines and my ones looked like sevens, so that step by step, the numbers would mutate. And the teacher had literally written on these tests, I think you understand the concepts, but you seem to be making Carol's errors. But I hadn't looked at that because that feeling of shame, that feeling of stupid was so powerful. By the way, I think that Phil wasn't doing so well in that class, and maybe you should be paying more attention. Um, and a, a question about that, though. So what you were identifying in your experience was how you actually identified as a person. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. So, and that's a very common thing with grades, right? It's part of people's identity. I'm an A student. I'm a C student. And so all of a sudden, that sort of grade gets tied into how you actually perceive yourself. And as you were just explaining, clearly you weren't an F student, mm -hmm. right? What was, what was an F about Hunter? His shitty handwriting, right? His process. Yep. So what's and, and that's all too common that we identify who we are with some other sort of outside thing, whether it's our job or our grades or our intelligence. 
But especially when we're talking in terms of school, and as tutors, it's really important to make sure that we're reinforcing that, that you are not your grade. Like grades are not your own, you know. As far as what we are, I don't know, some other sort of magical thing. That's, that's people that we are. Right? Scott is a unicorn. We're, we're supposed to tell anybody that. Um, but yeah, it's the process. And the thing about the process is the process can always be changed. Right? Just as, as with that sort of fix it focus practice that you were doing with your yeah. handwriting, you were able to change your process. And yeah. that's what's super empowering. You can always change your process. And I think to build off of what Scott is saying about identity is, is that again, these I think it's super helpful to sort of think about that old school village, that hunter gatherer village. Because there it wasn't a problem. Right? I was the hunter in the village. I was the fisherman in the village and all of that. And now we're all sort of trying to find our place in a country of hundreds of millions of people or a world of billions of people. And we can end up getting stuck very early in an identity of the class clown, right? Or the C student. Or, okay, I'm not going to be someone who does well in school but I could find my way through doing other things, like maybe I'm artistic, or maybe I'm this. But these identities end up becoming very limiting, as Scott is saying. And so much of this is about, I'm really glad you brought that up, depersonalizing this process so that you can just start to make everything about process. And you know, one of these say is, it's not you, it's what you do, right? But part of it is also recognizing that, you know, uh, you guys, who here is a Game of Thrones fan? Yeah. Oh, um, so, you know, there's that great scene where Cersei is made to do the Walk of Shame, and uh, again, my gift game is very weak. Um, but, you know, uh, the point is that there's this old nun who just walks around with this bell. Shame, shame, shame. And that is often the experience of a lot of people in school, right? We often feel that we are being shamed by the community for our failure rather than having a community that really embraces mistakes, analyzes them, and then is using them constantly to improve. How can we create a better ecosystem? How can we create a better community that is always learning and supporting? Because if, it's, you know, if you're failing, it's not, it's not even really personally you. It means that somewhere along the way, you didn't get the tools and support you needed to know how to teach yourself, how to make sense of things, and how to be able to work through this. So it's a, it becomes a group problem that we can all gang up on, and we can all figure out together. Um, so yeah, so you'll see you know, all of this data of bad mistakes is ending up in the waste paper basket. You're literally throwing away your most valuable data. And the reset that we used in the Strating Conspiracy was the example we used is plane crashes. You know? I mean, obviously, plane crashes Lots of people die. The stakes couldn't be higher. And yet, after the plane crashes, what do they do? They go through the wreckage, they figure out what went wrong, and they use that to then improve. And so this sort of FAA-type mindset where you're dealing with that is really what allows people to improve. And, you know, I mean, relatively speaking, right, the test is not a lion, right, and your S is not a plane crash. Nobody died, right? So we just have to go and we have to unpick what happened there. Um, but the mixed metal arts community actually came up with a far better reset, which is video games. Uh, apparently, the Heat Man level in Mega Man 2 is incredibly difficult. I don't know, um, because I never made it that far as a kid. But uh, Christopher Leon Price, who's a guy in the community, was like, he teaches chess to kids. And the reason why he teaches chess is because you are guaranteed to suck at chess when you first start playing. And so it's really just a great way to teach them what he calls the art of losing. Um, and so the whole point is, is that, you know, in a video game, when you die, you understand that that is part of the process of getting better. The point is to die many times so that you can keep on improving your process of getting past these bosses until you have eventually figured out how to beat the whole game. And the point is, is that there's no reason why you can't approach math or English or writing an essay or a foreign language as a video game. And it's like, you die, no big deal, guess what? You get another life. You can play again. You can pick yourself back up, and you can go on. And of course, you know, these are all resets. This is a reset that is very much along the same idea, right? But for humans, right, we need to be bathed in a culture. So we need to hear these same principles lots of different ways and told, you know, ways that we can hear it to really instill and reinforce those principles 
and just be reminded of them all the time. Because it's so easy to get wrapped up and lost on a particular day and feel like it's hopeless, we'll never be any good, you know, and we need our community to help us out. Um, so, one of the things that, you know, I think is important to recognize here is, you know, the sort of traditional incentives of an author. You know, the usual sort of gurification that we have in our uh, in our society is that I would come out here and I would tell you that I'm amazing, that I figured it out, that you guys should buy my book because all the answers are in here. And yes, yes, there are other books that say these other things and other people will tell you worth, worthwhile things. But the point is, is that they're not as good as mine and they're not as good as mine for this, 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 that reason. This is a classic behavior of academics. You remember I showed you the thing with Carol Dweck? And, you know, Carol Dweck for a long time, I don't know if she still has, claims that she discovered the growth mindset. Not really true. Humans have kind of known about that for a really, really long time. You might have formally studied it, but it's not actually helpful where we feel at a certain point like the magic person is needed in order for us to do this. The really helpful thing is you tow them and pull back the curtain. And so that's specifically why I'm saying Chris really on Price did a better job than we did in the straight A conspiracy. You have never heard of it. Um, and if you can create a culture where everybody is just borrowing and sharing their best ideas, then you have a really smart hive mind that can evolve better and better and better tools. That's why I'm highlighting that the Los Angeles Valley College community came up with something better than I did. Right? So the whole point is that this is a foundation. This is a starting place for the improv. But you can massively outdo everything that I'm giving you here. Um, and you know, my mom is from Kansas City, Missouri. Harry Truman was from Missouri. Uh, this is a quote that I'm very fond of. It is amazing what you can accomplish if you do not care who gets the credit. And that is very much the perspective in which we're approaching this. Like, we don't care who gets the credit, let's just fix the problem. And that's, I think, post-2016, whole Brexit, you know, U.S. election thing. Like, it's time to stop worrying about who gets the credit. We should just start solving things, maybe. <laughs> this whole global warming thing is apparently a problem. Uh, I don't know. So, this is that graph that I showed you about, you know, uh, the, the intelligence of a chimp and orangutan and a human toddler comes from this book, The Secret of Our Success. And it is literally the secret of our success as a species. It's always been a big question, and it is this ability to accumulate ideas, to build them over time. So, you know, the earliest hunter-gatherers have very few tools, right? Got some basic stone tools. They maybe know how to make fire, whatever it may be. But over time, you get more and more and more humans, and they're borrowing tools from each other. And so the toolkit starts to get larger. And of course, you know, one of the big questions that we often sort of have at this moment in history is why did Europe invent everything, right? And, you know, this is the ultimate genius myth, the genius myth of an entire civilization. And what you're going to find out is the more you start to look at this genius myth, the less it starts to make sense. So here are sort of a couple of pieces that I appreciate. You guys may have read Guns, Germs, and Steel. You ever heard of it? An amazing book. But one of the big, big things there is, is that in Europe, in the Middle Ages, there were an awful lot of famines. who just couldn't figure out how to feed themselves, and they died all the time. And then suddenly, that problem was solved. Except it was not so suddenly, because while Columbus may not have discovered the New World, he did initiate this process known as the Columbian Exchange, of crops going back and forth. And so what ends up happening is all these crops that had been domesticated by the Aztecs, the Inca, the Olmec, the Maya, were suddenly added to the toolkit of the Europeans. And so now Europeans, instead of having shitty wheat all the time, they gave them wheat belly, they had things like potatoes. Right? Think about German food. A lot of potatoes. Uh, think about Irish food. It's pretty much potatoes. And where do potatoes come from? The Inca. Uh, you know, southern Italian food is all tomatoes. Where do tomatoes come from? The Aztecs. So a lot of this myth of European success that we've sort of been told is actually that it's the merging of these two sets of toolkits. So it's actually a collective success story. But, you know, that, that power was then concentrated on one side of the Atlantic, and then inevitably when humans have a lot of power and it's not checked, they get corrupt. And uh, we now know that, you know, we've heard the old saying, power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. Specifically, what power does to the human brain is it makes people more impulsive and less empathetic. And if that sounds at all to you like the age of exploration and imperialism, 
Well, then, you know, I'll leave you to form your own conclusion there. But the point is, is that in, in terms of how we now start to evolve a better culture, it really is about pooling all the best tools from everywhere, every time and place. And that is really the point of mixed mental arts, is, is that, you know, uh, I think the most obvious example of this is food, right? I am not Thai, but I regularly enjoy Thai food, right? I am not uh, Middle Eastern, but I regularly enjoy Middle Eastern food, right? There are delicious cuisines all over the world. And there are also delicious ideas. Just before this, we were talking about Taoism. Taoism turns out to be pretty amazing. Um, and, you know, I think that if the more humanity sort of approaches this as, you know, this is our collective birthright, that there are these great things to draw from in all times and places. And, you know, I don't have to be a particular color to enjoy the four great novels of classical Chinese literature. They're just pretty awesome stories. Um, and so that's really the spirit that we want. But in the same way, what I'm doing here is just sort of hopefully introducing this set of tools to this community that you guys can then run with and popularize and spread so that every human being on day one is exposed to this total toolkit and has this knowledge that the world is built by people no smarter than you. And that is going to totally change what your experience of class is because rather than being, you know, just sort of in this emotional state because you didn't understand what was happening in class, you can deliberately manage and reset your emotions and choose to be in a state of engagement where you're choosing to open up your emotional Wi-Fi. <coughs> hey, I've only got zero bars here. Wait a minute, what's going on? Oh, wait, I want to get engaged with this because this grade is going to help me get the transcript that I want so I can go to UCLA or so that I can get the specific skills that I need to go and do this job so I can have a living, that I can support my family or I can do whatever, or if you're Christian, I need to learn computer programming if I'm going to be Steve Jobs. Like, I think probably I need to learn them. That's part of what we talked about last time. Your goal could still be to be Steve Jobs, but like really have the realistic goal where you go and acquire the skills you need to be able to succeed. Um, and so if it's towards that end, then great. Um, I have a uh, 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 the father of one of my students is, uh, he grew up in a not very nice part of Vancouver, and he remembers when he was in law school, he had a poster up on his wall. And I always tell this to my adolescent boys. And the uh, poster said, you know, the house, the car, the hot wife. And he's like, honestly, that's why I did well in law school. Because the whole time, that's what I was thinking about. I didn't really care about contract law, didn't really care about tax law, but I cared about the house, the car, the hot wife. And it's like, if that's what's going to work for you and get you fired up to then learn these things and do well, then, you know, whatever floats your boat. Um, so there are lots and lots of different resets, and, you know, we might not tell our resets to the world, and they may be, you know, maybe not the, you know, I want to save humanity resets, but they are there. Um, so, one of the things that we were talking about in terms of fear and all these different emotions is they're not bad. So this is actually an analogy from the Tao of Pooh. Um, and it's basically that, you know, the different emotions you have are like the keys on the piano. And often we tend to think that emotions are bad. And so we want to tear a key out. And we're like, I'm going to have no shame. I'm going to have no fear. I'm not going to have that. And that doesn't make for better music. What makes for better music is understanding what each note is for and understanding when to play it. So the big question is with emotions is when are they appropriate? When is fear appropriate? When is joy appropriate? When is joy inappropriate? When is curiosity appropriate? All of these different emotions. And so a lot of it is that we've often been trained to play certain notes in certain environments. So the second I get into the environment of math, fear, 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 fear. And you have to unlearn that musical piece and learn, okay, you know, I'm going to be calm. And so you're retraining what is the music, the emotional music that people are playing. Um, so, in terms of the elephant, you know, there is, you can end up with this sort of elephant, not just in academia, but really in any community. This is a really <coughs> good analogy for the United States right now. Um, and it could also be a good analogy for Los Angeles Valley College. So, you know, there's 20,000 people, they all have different insights, and all of those insights matter. 
And if you want to see what a group of people who knows how to use the elephant looks like, it's the Toyota production system. So what Toyota understood was that everybody has insight. And in particular, the guy who puts the wheels on the car and has been doing it for 20 years is the world's expert at putting wheels on the car. So if that guy says, listen, this little cart that's over here that I get the things from, every time I do this over 20 years, it messes up my back. If we could just put the cart here or in some other place, it would make the whole thing a lot more effective. I'm not going to throw out my back. You're not going to have to pay workers comp, right? And if that guy says that, we should be like, you know what? You know that part of the elephant better than anyone, and we're going to make those continuous daily improvements, what they call Kaizen. And so it's the same thing here. You have 20,000 people, and those 20,000 people all have lots of different little insights. And it's by embracing all those little insights and engaging in that continuous daily improvement that you will iterate this campus towards being what I think you, the potential you guys have is to be literally pioneering the model for what a community college and more generally college should look like in the 21st century. Because it's not going to come from the 800 pound gorilla that is Harvard. They're feeling pretty good about themselves right now. They got $15 billion. They don't think they have much to learn. And so they're just going to sit there like IBM or any of the other 800 pound gorillas with their thumbs up their butt. Whereas you guys are hungry, you want to do something different, and so you are the guys who are actually going to move things forward. So if we think about the patients on campus, right? Probably a fair number of them are currently like Cameron and Ferris Bueller's Daily, Day Off, right? They are, uh, you know, again, my gift game just needs so much work. Um, but, you know, Cameron basically lays in bed and, you know, there's nothing physically wrong with him, but he's just so emotionally disengaged and so turned up. And so it's about, you know, figuring out what is broken there, what genius myths did he internalize, what does he know about his brain. And that's where the doctor comes in, right? It can be House or it can be Sherlock Holmes. So the irony is that Sherlock Holmes, the, the detective, the criminal detective, is based on a doctor, and then House is based on Sherlock Holmes. So the, the blend between medicine, physician, and detective is the same. That's what a tutor is, right? You have somebody, they present you with a bunch of information, you try and extract as much information as you can, and what you're really trying to figure out from that mess of symptoms is why is this going wrong? So your job is to have acquired enough experience that you're actually good at causality. You're good at figuring out why things happen. And this is a thing my grandfather, because all my dad's family, as I mentioned, were doctors, you know, after hundreds of years of doing this, they came down to two different insights. One, if in doubt, leave it alone. General, the body is better at fixing itself than you are at fixing it. And two, the job of the physician is to diagnose. Anybody can lance a boil. Anybody can write a prescription. The hard thing is figuring out from all of this confusion what's really going on here. And so that's really the job of the educational physicians at Los Angeles Valley College, you guys. Important thing to realize is that the one, now that we do understand how human beings are special, what our superpower is, you're going to realize that the world is not based on these assumptions. So if you think about the old industrial education, it is based on sitting in chairs, everybody sits there, nobody talks. We're actually preventing socialization. So the educational system prevents us from learning in many ways. It is structured that way. And this is not the fault of anybody. You know, again, earlier humans had partial information. They didn't know as much as we do. Now that we understand it, we can iterate, we can evolve, and we can create a better system. Um, but, in the same way, you know, the reason why Steve Jobs says, you know, the greatest day of your life is when you realize that the world was built by people no smarter than you, is because for most of your life, you just blindly internalize whatever you've been told. And then at a certain point, you start to question. And so that's when you start to move past being sheeple uh, to actually questioning things. And, you know, that's uh, in many ways, you know, why is this happening in this moment in history? It's because of the experience of the 21st century and the internet. So, you know, I grew up all over the world, and so being born in Saudi, living in Brazil, living in Greece, living in England, I, you know, going into science, you know, then moving out here, I was moving between all these different cultures. 
There's a guy in the mixed metal arts community, Dave Colin. Uh, yes, his last name is Colin. It's rather unfortunate. Um, but he uh, he's at Second City, and he grew up in Alabama, and then moved all over the country. And he all he says asking a human being if they have culture is like asking a fish if it's wet. <laughs> you know, the fish may not realize that it's wet, but it's wet. And more and more, a lot of us are starting to have this experience of moving around between cultures, being exposed to lots of different cultures, where we start to realize that other people think really differently from how I do. They have a whole different approach to life. And so that's when, you know, at, at this moment, we have this opportunity to start to sort through all those different cultural differences. And Katie O'Brien, who, you know, Scott mentioned earlier, uh, analogizes and says this moment in history is like humanity's first family dinner. So we've all been off in our corners of the world trying to avoid each other as much as possible, occasionally doing really shitty things to do with each other, and then now we've all been shoved together at a giant dinner table, and there is so much awkwardness. It is so uncomfortable, and there are so many things to talk about. And, but, you know, it's as we start to have those conversations and start to really sort through everything that we've picked up, everything that's gone on, the stories we've told about ourselves, the stories we've told about each other, that we can start to evolve towards a better culture. Um, and so the point is, is that, you know, we really think that every human deserves to have this experience of the greatest day in your life, when you realize the world really was built by people no smarter than you. And that if you begin a society from that assumption, that you end up with a really, really great society, a society that is really worthy of its children. So, the real core of what a lot of this comes down to, and this is something, of all the things that I talked about last time, it wasn't something that I said. Uh, this was the thing that people most resonated with, which is Alvin Topper. Alvin Topper is a futurist. The literate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. And so learn, unlearn, relearn is, you know, the purple belt of the mixed metal arts belt system. And that's because this is a very, very different education from the one that we were given. The one that we were given was based around core skills. We're going to teach you reading, writing, and arithmetic. Right? We're going to teach you these foundational skills. But it's based on the idea that information is hard to get. Right? If the library is five miles down the road and I need to do something right now, I need that, that core skills stored in my head. If, on the other hand, everybody has one of these, it's easy to look things up. And so now I'm needing different knowledge at different moments, and so I need the ability to, okay, great, so now there's a job opportunity over here for computer programmers. I'm going to do that. But wait a minute, now they've just automated that. So now I need to go and I need to learn this other thing. And the ability to quickly pivot as and when things come along, that skill of learn, unlearn, and relearn. And so even though what we came to realize, Katie and I, is that even though we were teaching our students very specific things, like math or French or chemistry or whatever, that really the takeaway skill was learn, unlearn, relearn. And because it's that approach and that ability to manage your own emotions, manage your own attention, understand automaticity, understand Jesus, genius myths, not genius myths, genius myths, that was a whole can of worms that didn't want to open, genius myths, and you know, that ability is really, that's the real permanent stable skill that, you know, is really going to last with people. Um, so again, you know, the, the great thing about human intelligence is that it's actually been everywhere all the time. I didn't know about this. It was just sitting out there at Los Angeles Valley College. And what most of this then comes down to is that as we start to actually use our social intelligence, it becomes about connecting the dots. There are seven and a half billion dots, 60 million scientific papers, 130 million books. And we just didn't understand that the game that we have been playing all this time is a game of connect the dots. Now that we know the game, we can play the game. And the point is that if you get 20,000 people on this campus really connecting the dots, and then people are able to be like, holy shit, what is going on at Los Angeles Valley College? And, you know, Katie always says, so much of what really moving these ideas is going to come down to is FOMO, fear of missing out. So the point is, if there's so much fun being had in all these places and in these communities, and so much great stuff is happening, the people, then those sort of like basic mechanisms of wanting to be included in the fun are going to kick in. 
And people are going to be like, what's going on there? And it can start off with, in the Academic Resource Center, it can start off within this community where so much great stuff has happened. But part of it is letting yourself have fun. Letting yourself get personal. Which are, again, not cultural intuitions that we've been taught about learning. We've been taught that learning has to be super serious, and learning has to be super self-important, and that is why all those kids in Ben Stein's classroom in Ferris Bueller's Day Off are so bored. Ben Stein has been taught he has to be bored, and the kids have been taught they have to be bored. And we've actually taught that that sort of self-importance is really the key to learning, and it is not. And so there's Marshall McLuhan, who's the you know the great media scholar. He's the guy who came up with the term the global village. Um, and he said this great line, anyone who tries to make a distinction between education and under entertainment doesn't know the first thing about either. Right? So we need to erase the line between education and entertainment. And if you look at what the consequences of that line in our society are, well, you have mindless entertainment. So it's super entertaining. Transformers, shit blows up, grabs your attention. And there is fucking nothing going on in that story, right? And at the end of that, I just like feel like I was in the opposite of a sensory deprivation tank. Like it was the most extreme sensory experience, and I was like, what the hell is that crap? And then education is often very, you know, important, but it's just boring. It doesn't grab our attention. And so the way that this is supposed to work, the way that stories and songs work, when you look at cultures that get them right, is that the story grabs your attention, and then hidden inside of it, there's some sort of nugget or some sort of principle that you can extract and that you can take away. Um, and so the analogy that uh, Jordan Harbinger of the Art Charm uses is that it's about hiding the broccoli. There is cheese on the broccoli, but underneath there is broccoli. <laughs> and so when that is done right, you look at Pixar, right? Pixar's movies are the ultimate example of hiding the broccoli. Inside Out was made with the help of Dacca Keltner and Paul Ekman, who are these two legendary emotion scientists. And they figured out this awesome kick-ass story. And the lesson of that movie, spoiler alert, is that every emotion has a purpose. They all evolve for a reason. And you just have to understand what they're for, and then it's just like the emotional candle. Where is it appropriate, where is it not appropriate? But that's the sort of society that we now get to evolve because we finally understand how humans work. So again, here's another one. I did not come up with this. What is this? Humans thinking without the guru's permission? Will you still buy my shit? This is really worrying to me. Um, but so yeah, this is fantastic. So you know, uh, Carol Dweck's work on growth and fixed mindset is actually a subset of a much larger set of work from Martin Seligman called learned helplessness. And so humans have this emotional state called learned helplessness, where you can actually be stuck in this state where you feel like you have no control over your destiny, and that all you can do is just accept it. And so you have to unlearn that learned helplessness, and you have to learn empowerment. And you have to understand that you actually can control these things. And you know, the, the schema that is used within the research that I find most useful is like pervasive, permanent, and personal. So if you think about something like, I didn't get the math gene, okay, that is pervasive. You are screwed in all of that. It is personal. I am the problem. And it is permanent. I am not going to change my gene. As opposed to the sort of very specific thing that Scott was talking about when he was talking about my experience with physics. You have a problem with your handwriting. It is not that big of a deal. It is not you, it is what you do, it is your process, and it's fixable. And that is literally what I did. I literally changed as a teenager the way that I wrote my fours and nines, and my ones and sevens, because I was so annoyed that this is what the issue did. And so even an emotion like annoyance can actually be great fuel for social change. And of course, you know, one of the most powerful emotions for social change is anger, which was used by Gandhi and Martin Luther King and the suffragettes and countless others because they were just so fed up that they felt the need to demand something different. Okay, so that's part one and two, which is the bulk of what we're going to cover today, but Scott did ask for a brief sneak peek of part three and four. 
Um, so part three is School Made Easy, where we basically break down very specific skills. And we look at, now we know all these things about the brain. How should you be approaching these things? And this is basically about memory. So do you have a bad memory, or are you just using it the wrong way? So that's Homer, the poet, and that is the notorious B.I.G. They both love canes, apparently. I don't know what it is about lyricists and canes, but that's a thing. Um, and the point is that you know the Odyssey is and the Iliad were long as shit, and they were once entirely oral. So wow, how did those humans memorize them? And of course, you know lyrics, right, requires huge amounts of memorization, right? You think about having to perform a whole album on stage. How did you memorize all of that? Well, it's because what humans are good at memorizing is stories and songs. That's what we remember. Now the point is, you know, again, we could say, oh, but surely some geniuses have photographic memories. Except for, little secret, London cabbies. So these are guys who like fish and chips and rugby and are remarkably ordinary, actually have some of the best memories in the world. So New York City is arranged on a grid system. 34th Street, 35th Street, 36th Street. It's very easy to predict what the next street is. London, on the other hand, is pure Harry Potter. It is weird diagon alleys, and they all have these bizarre English names. And so if you see that street in orange, I have a feeling that, you know, you can't, you can't really see this. This is 37th Street, and then the one above it is 39th Street. I have a feeling you can guess what the orange street is in New York, which is amazing, right? Now, try and guess the orange street in London. Finsbury Circus is the correct answer, right? So the point is, um, you know, or there's Throckmorton Street, which is another great one. So uh, when I was a kid, I lived on Der Westin Mews. So you're just not going to guess these names. So if you're a cab driver and someone throws at you two Der Westin Mews, you're like, where the hell is that? Right? And so you literally have to memorize the entire map of London. And they not only have to memorize the map of London, they had to memorize 100,000 points of interest. So every tourist site, embassy, you name it. Like a huge amount of information. And the way they did this was they turned it all into story. So they basically made, they remembered the big routes through the city, and then they created a network of interlocking arts of that. And this is called the knowledge. It takes about three to four years to memorize. And in the age before GPS, cabbies would uh, you know, memorize the knowledge. And that was required to be a London cab driver. Now there's GPS. And it's kind of like their secret sauce is being lost. And all these people who are unregistered cab drivers are like, I have ways, dude. I don't need to memorize the knowledge. So well, information needs to be transformed in a way that we can remember. So there's, for example, a street called Carding Lane in London, which is really near the Savoy Hotel. Not particularly memorable, right? Carding Lane is kind of brilliant. It's near the Savoy Hotel. Who cares? So there's one feature of Carding Lane that makes it super memorable, which is that it has a street lamp that is illuminated by sewer gases from the nearby Soho Hotel. So instantly, that is disgust. That is a really strong, powerful emotion. And disgust makes things memorable. And so, you know, if you really wanted to remember Carding Lane, how would you do it? Well, you might think Farting Lane. Um, so the point is that that now, if you just watch your experience, you're having these strong emotions, there's a certain logic to it, and now it's starting to stick in place. So much of the work is this, is this work of transforming your information into memory glue, right? Through logic, emotion, and then when logic and emotion combine, you get story, so you can't forget it. So, you know, here we give an example of what that process might look like if a London cabbie had to remember nefarious. So you got this word nefarious, and you come up with a whole bunch of different ways of thinking it. So you're like, no, nah, it's kind of like me. And then you explore that, and you're like, no, that's a dead end. Nothing's happening with that. And then you're like, nefarious sounds sort of like furious. Furious is angry. And then you're like, yeah, but that's not what the word means. The word means extremely wicked or villainous. So that's a dead end. And then eventually, you might think of, oh, there's nefarious. There's like fairy in there. And fairies are good. So this is like the opposite of good, is it's wicked or villainous, right? And that's just sort of one example. But that's the real work to transform information, as opposed to drilling flashcards, 
right? Flashcards repetition is the fourth best memory technique. It's the worst memory technique. And the reason why it's baked into the educational system is because over a hundred years ago, a man named Herman Ebbinghaus decided that he wanted to study human memory. And he knew that the problem for his experimental design was emotion and logic. Humans remember those things. So what he did was he came up with a long list of nonsense words, and he repeated them in the most emotionless voice possible, and just flipped through these flashcards to see how repetition affected memory. But the story that came out from that experiment was not emotion and logic are really powerful. The story that came out was repetition is how you memorize. And you don't understand that the experimental design was to eliminate what was actually powerful about memory. And if you think about how students actually study, they're studying like Herbin anyhow. They're boring, and they're flipping cards again and again and again and again. And that can seem like, it can feel like that is the real important study. But you're far better off if you've got a list of 20 vocab words, take two to three minutes per word. Figure out some sort of memory glue that works for you, which is going to be deeply personal, customized, it's going to connect to whatever it is for you, so this may not work for you. You may find something else, right? And that's a much, much more effective way to study. But again, it comes down to understanding how do humans actually learn, and how have humans learned throughout history, across time, and across space. And the same students who will tell you that they have bad memories, if you start to quiz them on, like, how many SNL skits do you know? How many lines and plots from movies do you know? How many rap lyrics do you know? How many pop songs do you know? Right? And you'll find out that they have an encyclopedic knowledge of these things. <laughs> because humans are good at remembering stories. So memory glue makes everything stickier. So once you create a piece of memory glue, now you have something that latches into lots of other things. So there's all these words that have this root malum, right, which means bad in Spanish or French and in a whole bunch of English words. But once you know that mal means bad, now when you hear all these other words like malevolent, malice, malpractice, malnourish, malfunction, malcontent, they all instantly have somewhere to stick in your memory. So your brain can ultimately become super sticky. The more of this memory glue you create, it becomes like flypaper. And soon before you know it, everything is connected to everything else, and that's the sort of rich experience that you're having. And it starts to become meaningful, it starts to become enjoyable, and you start to really, really love learning. Because everything is just falling into place and connecting to everything else. So, part four, generation genius. The point is, is that you know, for most of human history, human potential has seemed like magic. And we now actually understand how it works. And now it's time to really start engineering a society that is based on the right assumptions about human potential. And so the point is that now, what I'm speaking in Detroit was about, is Detroit has had two golden ages. It had one with the automotive industry, and it had one with Motown. And now they're beginning to embark on a third. But the difference is that we now believe that it's time for a sustainable golden age, which is really based on designing a culture around human potential and how human beings actually work. And that is the opportunity for us now. And this is one of the places that has already started to embrace and act upon these ideas, and has already started to empower its community to start to innovate that culture and to figure out what that looks like. And uh, I will do anything I can to help move that forward, because I think that's the great opportunity of today. So it's important to realize, though, that you know, in this innovating, it can seem like innovation is intimidating. It can seem like more magic. But in fact, innovation is something remarkably straightforward. So that's actually all innovation is. You take two things that have never existed before and you put them together in a new form, right? In fact, we do this all the time with cooking. 
I'm glad this is playing again. Um, but we do this all the time with cooking. And it's not that every experiment is a success, right? One of the things I talk about all the time on the podcast is the time when I thought it was a genius idea to put whey protein in my coffee. Because I was like, like, protein and coffee, like, clearly better together. Yes. And apparently it wasn't. It was disgusting. And for years, Katie pretended to like it, and then she was just honest with me. But, you know, and it takes time having tried to put those things together to figure out how they can really harmonize and work well. So it's, you have to figure out, oh, the chocolate's on the outside, not the peanut butter's on the outside. And then, oh, that makes people's fingers sticky, so we need to put a paper cup around it. And you start to ultimately you iterate something better and better and better and better. But that's all innovation is. And it all really rests on this process of, yes, and improv comedy. Um, and if you haven't read Boston Pants, I highly recommend it. But it is creating this climate of improv comedy where people throw out ideas and rather than you know shooting them down, you're like, great, how do we build on that? How do we build on that? How do we build on that? And so that was literally the process of writing The Straight Conspiracy, was Katie and I just sat there. And the big, big thing was that even though she was coming from the humanities and I was coming from science, we built on each other's ideas, rather than me just being like, you're stupid. Well, I did a little bit of that. Um, because like there is a distrust between the humanities and science. And she was like, you're just so emotionally clueless. You scientists, you think you know it all day. Yeah. <laughs> but over time, we've evolved a pretty good improv, where we've moved past yes, but to yes, and. And so in the same way that we have evolved to have this instinct to run away and fight another day, we have this yes, but instinct in our human nature. And you know, so this is from Adam Hansen, who's part of the mixed middle arts community, and he described our ancestors as the savants of risk aversion. So uh, if you have two guys in the hunter-gatherer path, Og and Thrak, and they hear a rustle in the bushes, and Og hears the rustle in the bushes and is like, I'm just going to run right now, maybe poop myself a little bit and get the hell out of here, right? And Thrak is like, this is fascinating. I'm so curious, right? Curiosity literally killed the cat. Or curiosity got killed by a big cat, because that's what the rustling of the bushes ended up being. So our first impulse is risk aversion. We want to say yes, but. And it requires, you know, tabling that. And this is the whole thing. Adam is an innovation consultant. He teaches people how to innovate. And the whole thing is to realize, of course that is my impulse. But how do we start to build on each other and start to have that improv so that we can evolve upwards and innovate? I think we like the piece of peanut butter cup. It's amazing. Um, and Katie said yes, but to my way protein coffee, and I realized that not every idea is great. But you know, the point is, is that yes, you can build on each other's ideas and you can evolve something better. And again, not only is it about everybody knowing that the world was built by people no smarter than you. It's about building an age where everybody knows that innovation isn't magic, it's actually human nature. Because what innovation really comes down to is play. And humans want to play. They want to experiment, they want to play with ideas, they want to evolve better things, they want to play around. But again, when you think about that industrial age education, it doesn't encourage play, it doesn't encourage exploration, it encourages this sort of industrial task completion which were the focuses and the priorities of that age. Now we're at a different age, and we need a different way of engaging with ideas and with each other. So, we are saying things about the altitude, and the way you're treating the team was, you have a pretty passive life. I gotta get back on stage, you got like 10 minutes of rehearsal time left. Do you understand how condescending that just was? Well, maybe you don't. I don't want to see you get dragged out there. I can't think that's what I'm from you. You give out the path. You give, you give them to me. You're going to have a stroke, little buddy. What did you do? What did you do? Just don't tell me what you did. 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 Don't I built the circuit board. The graphical interface was stolen from Xerox Park. Jeff Raskin was the leader of the Mac team before he threw him off his own project. And then someone else designed the box. So how come ten times in a day, I read Steve Jobs as a genius? What do you do? I play the orchestra. 
and you're a good musician, you sit right there and you're the best in your role. I came here to clear the air. Do you know why I came here? Just answer that. I came here because you're going to get killed. Your computer's going to fail. You want to call to University Advisory Board telling you they need a powerful workstation for two to three thousand. You press next at sixty five hundred, and then those things will give you optional three thousand dollar hard drive, which people will discover isn't optional because the optical disc is too weak to do anything. And a $2,500 laser printer brings the total to $12,000. And in the entire world, you're the only person who cares that it's housed in a perfect cube. You're going to get killed. And I came here to stand next to you while that happens, because that's what friends do. That's what men do. I don't need your pass. We go back, so don't talk to me like I'm other people. I'm the only one that knows that this guy here is someone who invented. I'm standing by you because that perfect cube that does nothing is about to be the single biggest failure in the history of personal computing. Tell me something else I don't know. So ironically, my father in the 90s sold next computers. Um, it was uh, it was Steve Jobs' great failure, and most people don't realize that. But all of those lessons of next computers ended up being the foundational cornerstones of the iPhone, the iPod, and all of that. So Steve Jobs failed in a very dramatic way, right? which is usually not part of the story. But there are also a lot of things that are important here for Christian, which is what did Steve Jobs actually do? And he played the orchestra. He stole a lot of ideas, he packaged them together, and then he was able to get the community to work together and to harmonize and to build off of each other and to engage in that great improv. And that is what all of these people have always done, right? Mozart said, there is scarcely a master in whose works I have not studied. He brought together all this other music that had existed before, and he figured out how to harmonize it in a new way. Michael Jackson did the same thing. That's what Europe and America did to be able to conquer the world. He brought together the toolkits of lots and lots of great people. And the point is, is that that is what we all now need to do as humanity, is we need to get the orchestra playing together. Um, and that requires taking the best ideas from wherever they may exist. And uh, the quote that sort of, you know, has sort of become the cornerstone principle of mixed mental arts is from Bruce Lee. Um, because Bruce Lee studied all these different fighting styles. And what he realized is that any one fighting style you learn, there are holes in it. There's an orthodoxy, and people are going to exploit those holes. And so his point was to have a style that is no style. And the cornerstone is he said, Take what is useful, discard what is not, add what is uniquely your own. And that's it. That's really what I've got for you, is what Bruce Lee said decades and decades and decades ago. The point is, is that there's lots and lots of tools out there, and the more you can get a hive mind, a group of 20,000 people, or ultimately 7.5 billion people, who are all taking and borrowing those tools from wherever they can find them, that's how you're going to really start to evolve that kick-ass ecosystem where people are taking care of themselves and then the educational physicians are there to only deal with the most intractable problems. So, on that note, anything you guys need, you can always reach me, you can always contact me, and uh, thank you.